opportunity to thank the uh, organizing committee for their hard work, the co-organizers, uh, our sponsors, and most importantly, your participation to make this uh, symposium a reality. I hope that you'll find this uh, symposium uh, enjoyable since you are joining us uh, in the comfort of your home. So maybe next year we can meet in person and uh, we could probably uh, have a chat uh, over a cup of tea. Uh, so once again, I, I thank you uh, for being here. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof Chan. Okay. So next, uh, we will have to, uh, we will be inviting uh, Dr. Pushpa uh, Jananathan, Pushpa Malar Jananathan, who is a senior lecturer at the School of Science, Monash University, Malaysia. She's also the deputy director, Monash Industry Palm Oil Education and Research Platform. Uh, Dr. Pushpa, Pushpa Malar is the chairperson for the e-symposium on green transformation of agro waste 2020. And it gives me great pleasure to invite her to give her opening remarks as the chairperson of this e-symposium. Dr. Pushpa. Okay. Um, yeah, good morning to everyone. Yeah. Uh, thanks for attending this symposium. So we have put a lot of effort to bring um, uh, the university, industry and uh, government together in this symposium platform. And this symposium could potentially um, exploit many ideas from research in uh, universities um, that are used through collaboration between uh, universities and um, firms. Yeah? So university industry collaboration can bring many benefits uh, as we know. So research outcomes can flow uh, to industry and it also could trigger or fuel um, research questions. Yeah? So uh, academia, government and private industry have all played essential roles uh, in developing uh, a country. So the success of uh, technology uh, offering is very crucial uh, contribution uh, from each of these uh, three sectors. So to transform uh, an idea uh, into a technology and the technology into a product and finally the product um, reaches the market. So um, this could happen only when co collaboration with the industry and uh, forming new ventures should be embedded in the university research culture, which um, happening now, but uh, not much, but uh, we are encouraging this. Um, uh, due to that, that actually I have come up to this uh, symposium. Yeah? So I hope that this symposium will trigger collaboration works between uh, university, government linked companies and private industries. Yeah? So hopefully that everyone will benefit from um, this platform. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pushpa. So uh, we are ready for our uh, symposiums to start uh, with the first keynote address. So our first keynote address is by Associate Professor Dr. Poon Wai Ching. Uh, she's an Associate Professor of Economics at the School of Business and Director of Graduate Research Programs at Monash University, Malaysia. Her area of research is in the business and financial economics, as well as sustainable development. Dr. Poon is the top 25% economist in Malaysia and has published widely in her high quality mainstream and multidisciplinary journals. She's an editor for Cogent Economics and Finance and serves in the editorial board for several tier A journals. She's also a subject matter expert for Malaysian Finance Association and Chartered Tax Institute of Malaysia and serves as a panel grant assessor for Malaysian Competition uh, Commission. Her research outputs have enriched a lot of businesses and she's given expert advice and opinions to the media on current issues that impact Malaysia, Malaysian economy. So let's welcome Associate Professor Dr. Poon to give the first keynote address on upcycling of palm oil biomass for regenerative agriculture. Now, Dr. Poon has asked me to uh, play her video of her presentation. At the end of the presentation, we will have some time for some Q&A. So uh, please listen to her video. A very good morning to all. I hope all of you are adjusting to the new norm. 
I am Tun Wei Cheng from the School of Business, Monash University, Malaysia. I wish to thank uh, MIPO, uh, Monash Industry, Palm Oil Education and Research Platform uh, for inviting me to be the keynote speaker for today's symposium. So uh, today we are going to examine a circular economic framework for the palm oil industry and why palm oil biomass waste is a critical resource for the circular economy framework. This is the outline of my presentation. I hope we have enough time to step through the key areas today. However, please do not hesitate to contact me uh, in the School of Business, uh, Monash University for more information. Palm oil industry has been in the limelight over the years, uh, especially our country and Indonesia, and it does have pertaining environmental, social, and governance, in short, ESG challenges. Given the degradation of soil conditions due to aggressive chemical fertilizers input and decrease in plant health and yield as a result of deterioration of soil conditions, which lead to our environmental and sustainability issue. The other challenge is from the social angle. Given the significant percentage of uh, the planted palm oil estates are owned and uh, operated by the smallholders. Hence, the soil conditions and yield performance greatly affect the livelihood of the smallholders and uplifting the yields and bridging uh, the yield gaps is one of the primary focus of the industry policymakers in addressing rural communities' social well-being. The third is um, the third is actually from the uh, governance issue. Given the pragmatic economic needs of respective palm oil producing countries and the fact that palm oil as a significant food and renewable resources, being 35% of current global vegetable oil and its oil yield productivity of more than six times the next alternative seed oil. Certain palm oil consuming countries and NGOs approach of alienating and boycotting the palm oil is not an option as this will inevitably result in more land needed to be converted for the alternative crops in order to meet the growing demand. There is a mystic link in sustainability in the uh, palm oil business as usual scenario, where the two major biomass waste, i.e. empty fruit bunches, EFB, that are disposed in landfill, and palm oil meal efferent, pome treatments via lagoon base that involve an aerobic biodegradation process that generates significant amount of biogas, which is a greenhouse gas that has 21 times CO2 emission equivalent. The palm oil industry has since explored other base treatments for EFB and POME that in most cases ultimately will remove this biomass away from the estates and deprive the soil, uh, the much needed organic content in sustaining uh, a health soil ecosystem. But this type of practice and the aggressive chemical fertilizers application has contributed to the worsening of soil condition and ecosystem. In the events, the waste treatment mechanism adopted by POM with the sole purpose to meet the regulatory compliance. And as a cost factor or with uncertain economic uh, sustainability will lead to neglect over time if not managed appropriately. It is not uncommon that POM adopt different waste treatment or different biomass 
waste stream and did not take into consideration the need uh, or the potential benefits of the estate in their investment decision. And therefore, a circular economy framework that have a, uh, that has key elements of a regenerative factors and address the missing link might provide insight for the palm oil upstream industry. As I mentioned earlier, there are other ways treatments options for palm to adopt other than the business as usual scenario, which is always the fallback position in the event the adopted waste treatment did not work as planned, or the byproduct markets uh, or economic conditions has changed, uh, such as the current COVID-19 pandemic, which presented various techno-economic challenges for a consistent and economically viable solution. We have seen many failed waste treatment projects due to imbalanced technology capex, not engineered in, and the usual budgetary and operating cost barriers. As you can see from this common waste treatment options, only mulching and composting uh, return the processed biomass back to the estate. Those in red color have known techno economic challenges and barriers. Those in blue color need to uh, factor in the relevant operation of constraints, economics markets, and technical expertise, HR availability. And therefore, investment and strategic direction must consider the biomass valorization pathways that take out non-controllable factors as much as possible. An industry-wide circular economy framework of standard practice that is regenerative with sustainability intensification will perhaps address negative image of oil palm upstream industry and also the concern from palm oil producing countries and NGO. With improved yield and sustainability intensification of the biological asset to produce will go towards addressing global demand and lessen the uh, pressure for more irritable land. For those of you who might not be familiar with the term bioorganic fertilizer, BOF, bioorganic fertilizer, are composted biomass that contains high concentration of beneficial microbes currently due to the waste treatment process. It is well documented that soil fertility is closely correlated to presence of beneficial microbes colonies, flora and fauna in the soil ecosystem. And these microbes need organic matters and adequate moisture to survive and propagate. Large scale of uh, bioorganic fertilizer production faces two challenges. First is about the availability of large volume of consistent biomass as fat stock. And two, uh, to ensure large CFU count of targeted microbes. The composting process or production process must be optimal for the growth of these microbes, precise and control. The palm oil industry has a history of unsuccessful uh, windrow based composting process due to the inherent uncontrolled composting environment, especially for bioorganic fertilizer production that often produce substandard or uncomposed uh, composed due to manual process intervention and uncontrolled composting environment. And composting periods can uh, range from 40 to 90 days. So, 
coming back to our circular economy model for agriculture, where long-term soil remediation can be addressed, while you're consistent upcycling biomass waste into BOF, especially when we can find waste treatment approach that address those techno economic challenges that we discussed earlier. It will be economically viable, especially when we factor in estate's yield improvement with significant environmental performance improvement in reducing greenhouse gas emission. So what is basically circular economy? A circular economy model needs to have three key factors. First, design out waste and pollution as much as possible. Two, keep the biomass waste stream in use. Three, this is the most important component is that it has regenerative factors and components. So in addressing design out waste and pollution, we need to consider the waste treatment. Um, we need to consider the uh, waste treatment mechanisms that can provide okay. maximum valorization okay. of biomass waste. Aisha. which address economic resilience mm -hmm. oh. and sustainability factors, especially uncontrolled market condition and the environmental factor that keep the biomass in use and uh, the practice must demonstrate key factors that goes towards plant health improvement and yield. And regenerative natural system enhance a circular economy model that addressing uh, the ESG challenges of the palm oil industry that we have highlighted earlier. Let's look at the case study where palm oil group has been practicing upcycling of the biomass waste as BOF or soil remediation since 2011. This is for more than 10 years and how it addresses techno-economic challenges. Now, starting uh, from the um, bottom, from the uh, bottom of the slide is about the estate. So SSB are collected from estates and sent to pump for processing, where crude palm oil and palm kernel oil will be extracted and the palm oil meal process will generate biomass waste, such as palm kernel shell, palm uh, basal cup fiber, are uh, being used as the feedstock for the palm biomass power and boiler for power generation for self-sustaining use. The biomass waste from the biomass power plant is the boiler ashes. The rest of the biomass, the solid type, say empty fruit punches, EFB, the semi solid type, the canter, cake, or sludge, are sent to landfill. And uh, from here, um, when we, uh, all this, uh, okay, and the uh, liquid waste, pom, pomade is treated in the lagoon system in the business as usual scenario. Now in the diagram, we should show the case that the biomass flow and process, all these biomass waste are sent to the in-vessel core composting plant to be treated into compost with additional beneficial microbes cultivated in the same core composting process, which is the BOF. The resulting BOF are picked up by the empty trucks that send the uh, FFB to home to be sent back to the estate to be reapplied to the field. The other biomass waste from the estate, pump, cut, drawn, are stacked together with the BOF. The top Left side corner is the core composting plant layout. This particular pump used an in-vessel composting process in the past 
10 years. That's employed 15 control environment composting chamber, whereby all the biomass waste generated by the pond are put into CECC. With PLC of computer control environmental composting. The inversal composting plant is built next to pump, and therefore no biomass flow logistic issue for both solid and liquid waste stream. And since the core composting process takes 14 days under optimal aerobic composting conditions, the composted biomass will be removed from the CECC into the curing bay curing area here after 14 days for a further 14 days curing period to cool down, okay, to cool it down. So you can imagine every day new biomass can fit into the chamber and since the composting process is 14 days and on the 15th day, while you are filling the 15 chambers, you can now remove the composted biomass from the first chamber and ready the chamber for the next batch the following day. Right, if you need further technical detail, please uh, email or contact me for further information after the seminar, after the, the symposium. Right, since the environment was controlled, the process is precise and set to be optimal condition for the composting and beneficial microbes production. These circular economy practices are within the pond and surrounding participating estate sphere of influence. As you can see, when we take the KPI from this case study and extrapolate onto a typical pond that process approximate 200,000 uh, FFB per year source from the surrounding about 10,000 to 15,000 hectares, this estate in turn apply the BOF, the fertilizer, uh, organic fertilizer, back to the estate for soil remediation. We have waste treatment productivity gain of approximately 980,000, logistics saving from no removal of biomass, and BOF upcycle back by the empty trunks that brought in the FFB. Reduced chemical fertilizer application rate in addition to BOF applications would represent a cost saving in fertilization. And assuming two metric tons per hectare increase in FFB yield, we have an economic impact of 20.6 million per year, assuming the OER of 0.2, CPO price of uh, Ringgit Malaysia 3.3 K per metric ton. This would represent close to about Ringgit Malaysia 21.9 million times three times local economic knock on effect. The optimal valorization can be realized in the event the pump has adopted biogas capture and biogas power production using pumping and the resulting biogas digesters, sludge and liquid discharge are used as fat stock for the in-vessel composting process. This is the scenario where pumping is being treated with biogas digesters and, kept and biogas digesters, liquid and semi-solid discharge are sent to the core composting plant for further process. And this scenario will add addition revenue from the sale of biogas capture or biogas power generated in addition to bioorganic fertilizer produced as a byproduct of the waste treatment. The role of POM is key in the circular economy model and framework as it can provide the power and local network infrastructure 
for the local community. With the integrated waste treatment complex that treats all the waste streams into renewable energy and BOF for long-term soil remediation. With the local renewable power and network infrastructure, we can envisage the deployment of uh, industry uh, revolution 4.0 precision agriculture and local shared digital platform for supply chain automation with SME. With the upcycling of biomass that improves soil ecosystem and better yield. Upcycling biomass as bioorganic fertilizer as can deliver the revenue generations for economic sustainability and soil revitalization for sustainability intensification. Potential policy can be the commonly acknowledged sustainability intensification platform reaching the producing country's pragmatic legitimacy and the consumer's country's moral legitimacy to a sustainability intensification for food security. Building sustainability and a circular economy value change is a strategic policy. It's a uh, strategic policy direction in addressing post-pandemic revitalization, climate change risk, and social costs. For those who are interested, here are some of the references that supported our finding. With that, I will uh, I end my presentation here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Poon, for the keynote address. Looks like there are many options for um, palm oil biomass to be converted to useful products. So we have about five minutes uh, before the next speaker. If there are any questions, um, we, the floor is open. Dr. Poon is uh, waiting, is here with us. Hi, good morning. Uh, Nick Farid from Samdaviri Plantation Research. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's a very good uh, information on the composting. Uh, may I know your opinion? Because composting, there are two. The mechanical aeration using the turner uh, mechanical means. Or the one that you're presenting now is the force aeration. Can you comment which one is the, a better one? Or is there any pro and cons for us to select this, between these two methods for composting? Thank you. Dr. Poon, you're on mute. Okay. Uh, thank you, Nick Mohammed Farid, uh, for your question. This is a, a very good question. So a uh, window has an uh, operational challenge, definitely. Um, actually, I would say any kind of approach or methods, they are pro and cons. So why uh, the, uh, the large scale uh, the last scale, uh, share, the last scale uh, operators they do not want to use certain method definitely, uh, largely uh, because of cost matter, right? And uh, we also have to uh, refer to the other types of uh, factor as well. Uh, perhaps something related to the technology, something related to the um, labor. Uh, whether they know how to use certain technology or not. And aside from, uh, for, from those, we also need to know, uh, try to come up with a comparison. Uh, the windrow operation is not conducive with uh, the BOF production, basically. Thank you, um, Dr. Poon and Dr. Mr. Nick. Any other questions? Hi, uh, Dr. Boon. This is uh, Abu Zahrim from UMS. Uh, regarding your uh, presentation, may I know 
uh, from your observation, is there any leachate that come out from the uh, investor system? Yes. Uh, are they uh, recycled the leachate or they just uh, dump it, the leachate from the investor system? They recycle back to the system. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions for Dr. Poon? That's it. Uh, I would like to apologize for the hiccup uh, at the it's beginning okay. of the, yeah, okay. It's okay, we all understand it's the, it's the technological thing that we have no control over. Thanks. <laughs> well, at least you were prepared, you know, you had your presentation uh, ready for, for this. Okay, so can we thank uh, Dr. Poon for her excellent talk? And now we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, the next keynote speaker, which is Professor Kharia Haji Badri. Professor Kharia, uh, currently an academic member in the Department of Chemical Science. She serves as the head of Industrial Linkage Unit for Polymer Research, University of Kebangsaan, Malaysia. She has done a double degree in chemistry and chemical and petroleum refining engineering from Colorado School of Mines and a PhD in polymer chemistry. Professor Karia started her career as a researcher in wastewater plant at Cruz Brewing Company, Colorado, US. Upon returning to Malaysia, she joined several companies, some of which Top Globe, Sindrian Berhad, Bina Puri, Sindrian Berhad, before she joined UKM as a professor in polymer chemistry. In UKM, Professor Karia has set up a pilot plant to produce polyurethane polyol, as well as a startup company that converts agricultural waste into imitation wood. This pre-commercialization work has been acknowledged widely by the Malaysian government. She works closely with industries and is often hired as a consultant to rubber and polyurethane industries. So let's welcome Professor Karia to give the second keynote address on Malaysian scenario in practicing the three R for agricultural waste management, waste to wealth. Dr. Karia. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. Tachi uh, Hao, Happy New Year to all my uh, Chinese uh, colleagues here. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Dr. Pusfa and uh, the Secretariat of the Symposium for your kind invitation for me to share my views on the agricultural waste today. And um, perhaps today we are not going to talk too much about uh, technical, more on the foresight of what is happening and what is going to happen in future re in regards to agricultural waste. So, uh, but uh, I would like to thank the Professor Amu for the for your very kind uh, introduction of myself. I don't have much, but what I can share is that uh, I'm part of the panel or assessors team to uh, three ministry, uh, and um, in fact, it involves a lot about industrial grants. And I'll be happy to help out any one of you if there happens to be. Um, some sort like needs that uh, you acquire from myself. But I feel responsible to bring the foresight of having 100% of agricultural waste in industry. So for that, let me draw your attention to the recent uh, dialogue uh, by uh, uh, EU representative, uh, whereby this dialogue was uh, organized by uh, Sao Paulo's uh, University in the Philippines. Uh, why I'm bringing this slide to you is to uh, catch your attention that e European countries is in collaboration with Asian countries uh, in order to offer grants that can help out to uh, establish a collaboration project to um, some sort like handle the plastic waste. We are talking about plastic waste. 
But from the dialogue itself, what I can uh, summarize is that uh, it seems like plastic waste has catch a lot of attention from the researcher's point of views. But in terms of agricultural waste, it seems like it is being left out. Whereas it is half of the, or I can say that globally, it is half of the portions that we needs to be think about. So from there, I think what we have to understand is that around our uh, environment and surrounding us, there are several ways that uh, are not really being uh, managed uh, in a very proper system. Uh, this includes domestic waste, factory waste, e-waste, construction waste, agricultural waste and food processing waste that we are going to talk about today, biomedical waste and nuclear waste. If we can see from this uh, large list, we can, we can further understand that uh, big portions have been uh, handled by our uh, waste disposal uh, companies especially those located in Negeri Sembilan. And I'm very sure this afternoon we are going to listen to Tersiva, uh, who is a representative from Epix uh, Senviro. So what is agricultural, agricultural waste? I thanks uh, Dr. Poon for a very um, interesting introduction to circular economy. Uh, but we focus more on uh, the palm oil industry. But uh, not to left out, we have some other agro-based industries that produce a lot of agricultural waste. So when we talk about agricultural waste, we are talking about animal waste. We are talking about food processing waste, crop waste, hazardous and toxic waste. So how are we going to uh, some sort like uh, have it improve in order to ensure that the circular economy model can be applied to all these type of waste? So it is very important to provide a new method in agricultural waste management system in order to achieve sustainable agriculture. And we are not talking about just the innovation, but also how to make it a sustainable innovation. The agricultural sector in Malaysia plays a significant role in the overall economic growth. And the Department of Statistics has reported that the agricultural sector generates 89.5 billion ringgit to the GDP in 2018. And uh, of course, from this part of the uh, numbers, the agricultural waste is also produced in an increasing number. It was projected that uh, in, uh, we are going to have about 0 0.210 kilogram per capita per day by 2025. As to that, we understand that solid waste management will have to play an important role in maintaining a sustainable environment in order to tackle this agricultural waste matter. However, I need to make uh, my audience uh, to understand that waste management and waste minimization is not solely the responsibility of the local authorities. We have to play the roles. We, the academia, we, the public, we, the ministry, we, the industry is no longer the quadruple helix. We are talking about everyone, every single person that we have uh, in any of the countries have to play the roles. And if you are looking at this, uh, even globally, um, we have the SDG being announced. And all research need to focus on several things that uh, uh, some sort like can settle the problem on agricultural waste. I would like to highlight uh, some parts of the SDG. And we are talking about the uh, SDG 3 to ensure healthy, healthy life and promote well-being for, for all at all ages. And this is a, a part of ways to sustainable agricultural waste management system. Another is SDG 11 to make cities and homes uh, settlement inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. And not to forget SDG 11 and SDG 15. And uh, this includes also clean water and sanitize, sanitation and also affordable and clean energy. I recall one of the audience asked about the leachage uh, problem. So do not forget that if uh, this 
matter is not being handled properly, we are not going to have clean water and good sanitization. Um, food processing waste, we have a lot of them. We have a lot of food waste, especially during the pandemic. Everybody is doing things at home. Uh, we are uh, not allowed to uh, go across the countries, but do not forget that we are now allowed to eat in the restaurant. Uh, waste from the restaurant itself is generating a big, or I would say a huge landfill of waste. But we are not going to look at this, this in a, a, a very critical manner because uh, many of these uh, waste has been handled accordingly in regards to many of the industries in Malaysia nowadays. Uh, some sort like um, uh, recycling it in uh, many ways. What we want to focus today is on the agricultural waste means coming from the plantation itself. So we are talking about agro waste that can be viable for the value added products. We are talking about agro waste that can be converted into biogas, biofertilizer, uh, biofuel, or in fact energy and also as a, a part of the pulp and paper uh, materials. So we understand that the evolution of biocomposites in Malaysia has gone extensively. And we know that uh, somehow many of the industries have taken the challenge to come up with uh, composites that make use of the plant fibers. These composites, which is called biocomposites or green composites, are normally blending of biopolymer matrix and reinforcement of natural fiber. But somehow we always miss the other part of this biocomposite. That is what they call as biopolymer. Degradation issue is the subject. Biodegradation has been questioned. Whether we are producing the biocomposites in the matter of just using the natural plant fiber and not focusing on the biodegradation of the whole system. If you look at the right hand side, side of the figure, we can uh, see that uh, uh, many of the uh, pathway towards producing the biocomposites have been uh, uh, gone through by many of the researchers in Malaysia. However, the success to produce it for in terms of industrial skills is a very small numbers. Somehow, if we compare to uh, uh, countries outside of Malaysia, we understand that many of the crops have been uh, purposely grown, grown to produce the fiber. Why is that so? It is because the biocomposite has uh, uh, some sort like play roles in their life and has been used uh, in their daily uh, life. Uh, why is that so? What is the lacking in our country? So if we, if, in fact, if we look at the biocomposite market, we can see that even uh, towards achieving, uh, I mean, reaching 2025, the market for biocomposite can reach up to 450 billion US dollar. So this is a very big market. And major focus is given in construction, material, manufacturing, and also automotive sector. Do not be surprised that one day, uh, major parts of the automotive, uh, our car, make use of, uh, natural plant fiber. So this is the normal scenario that we normally see, uh, not only our researchers, but our industrial partners is using. What they do is that they get the agro-based feed, uh, feedstock. If let's say it is coming from the uh, oil palm industry, uh, common selection is empty fruit bunch fiber. So what happens is that they were being processed into small uh, sizes of fibers and being uh, blended with plastics. Uh, somehow it can be also bioplastic. This is common scenario. But then when we talk about the supply and demand, can we make it? Can we achieve the target or can we achieve the demand of the, let's say, Malaysian? So this is something that has to be paid attention for. Uh, why is that so? If we look at the scenario in uh, uh, outside of Malaysia, 
major focus for the biocomposites is more for the automotive industry. Yeah, automotive industry. Uh, I've seen people use it for aircraft. I've seen uh, people use it for a uh, lightweight uh, car. So if this is the matter, then what is the problem with our Malaysian innovation? So the only thing that I can answer of is that we are lacking of LCA or the assessment on the life cycle. Life cycle of the biocomposite or we call it biodegradable polymers. We try so hard to produce value added products, but we didn't think about the pathway or the chain uh, along the way. If you look at this figure here, yeah, this is what being practiced outside of Malaysia where we have natural resources and then what happened is that they convert it both. Yeah? Uh, I mean, the whole parts of the plant is being used partly as the matrix and partly as the filler being processed and then they, uh, is be they are being used and then they are discarded after some time and the biodegradation happened and then it will uh, evolve the GHG and the photosynthesis uh, is a cycle. It's a cycle that uh, make use of the whole system. So if we uh, look at the uh, scenario whereby they make use of the corn cob, uh, corn, yeah? we don't grow corn much in Malaysia. We grow it for uh, common um, snacking or uh, you know, for a daily consumption, not for a larger scale. But in outside of Malaysia, what happened is that the corn cob can even be uh, used to produce uh, carbon fuel uh, and also biochar to generate energy. And it goes back to the processing uh, plant and uh, the processing plant make use of this uh, biochar and uh, carbon fuel to generate energy to operate the production. And the leftover or the waste uh, is used as the soil enhancer. And it goes back to the crops as a fertilizer. And the cycle go, goes on and on. So we want it to be like that. I know we have amongst the audience people from Sam Dhabi. Uh, I know Sam Dhabi is practicing part of this. Uh, can we say that it is a cycle? I think we have to listen to their talk later. Yeah, well, they are sharing. So in terms of uh, doing that, how do we go for, for it? I mean, it should start from, shall we start it from the government? Or shall we start it from the researcher? Or even the uh, academia itself, uh, combining the researcher? Or shall we start from the industry? So this, this roadmap is being designed uh, in uh, regards to the collaboration of all parties. Yeah, the academia and the researchers should have uh, in mind that whatever is being researched for, as they make use of the, for example, natural plant fiber, not only that it can uh, replace the non-biodegradable uh, materials like the petroleum-based materials, but also to think about how this product can be made, uh, fully utilized when they end up as waste. Meaning it is a cycle again. So in this matter, there are several applications, as you can see in this figure, that uh, can be uh, focused on. Yeah, and we know that packaging industry are the most that can make use of this uh, roadmap. So concept of sustainable bio-based product should focus on three things: renewable bio-based, recyclable, natural recycling. We are talking about uh, not recycling in a way that you create another waste. I give you an example. You try to get the cellulose from the fiber, but then you are also producing waste from the uh, solutions that you use to treat the fiber to get the cellulose. So it has to be a natural recycling. And to trigger biodegradability, how do you improve? How do you... Um, initiate to have a biodegradation uh, properties that is as high as possible. So this will create the sustainability as what Dr. Poon mentioned before. So if we look at this uh, bio-based composite, 
uh, recent and in fact uh, uh, very very uh, common to see that uh, the scenario that is being practiced by us as the researchers the industry is that we love to blend the fiber with uh, plastic with petroleum based plastic so why not make use of the plants totally so when this happened we can see that uh, this has generated new commerce not really new things uh, uh, materials like pla polylactic acid it's not new but to what extent has it been used in the market in order to come out with value added products so if we look at the properties itself it gives you a humongous properties that can make uh, we can make full use of it we know that some parts of the plant fibers are hydrophilic and some parts are hydrophobic i will get you to the uh, trends where they use the uh, hydrophobic natures of the plant fiber to build road and uh, this uh, this is something that uh, make people make us understand that uh, if we know the chemistry of the plant fiber itself we can understand better of how to uh, further improve the properties of the value added products that we intend to have okay i'm going to skip this because these are common uh, bio based uh, polymers that uh, can replace the petroleum based polymers that are now readily available okay in the market i'm very proud to say that malaysia has made a lot of improvement to come out with this in larger scale and uh, these are commercially available plant fiber source and uh, many of them are actually imported i see many of the industries that i i i have connection with that are still uh, importing fibers from outside and why is that so why do we have to because many of these are actually available in malaysia so it is a very sad scenario to see that uh, quite a numbers of industry are still importing fibers from outside yeah and uh, many researchers have focused on trying to improve properties of the biocomposites that they have by making use of uh, the plant fibers and if you can see the most important part is the elastic modulus and also the tensile strength we is it can still not uh, capable of uh, beating the uh, the fiberglass e glass okay it still cannot beat so how can we tackle this how can we further explore in in order to ensure that the plant fiber can be make full use of it so if we look at the range of uh, thermosetting polymer and of course some of them are petroleum based we can further um, some sort like manipulate the uh, polymer part to increase the performance of the biocomposites and this is the reason you know why many researchers uh, could not uh, or couldn't afford to um, not looking at the petroleum based uh, polymer yeah these are the the, the petroleum based uh, uh, polymer the polypropylene the ldpe these, these are all plastic from petroleum based so we have these fibers produced in malaysia a lot of them we have a lot of kenaf fiber being planted in uh, kelantan we have a lot in perlis yeah kenaf fiber if you go to the sites if you go to the plantation you can see that they if you ask them further it is sad to know that uh, many of our industries that produce kenaf they export it to country like korea why not make use of it in our country okay and uh, i also have these uh, 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 two industries in in uh, kuala lumpur who make use of uh, used woods from um, um, houses kampung houses that are not in use so they take the woods and they carve it but the wood uh, seems to produce a lot of sawdust yeah we call it wood fibers and how do make we make use of it it shouldn't be uh, just thrown away on the soil 
We also have a lot of coconut fibers, especially in the east part of Malaysia. Again, Kelantan and Terengganu. And uh, of course, all palm fibers uh, as what MIPO is concentrating on, uh, MIPO Monash University. And we also have bagas. So these are local fibers that should be paid attention for. Yeah. Uh, so what are the trends in biocomposites that we should be looking into and further explore? We have a lot of biogas uh, houses. Are they a success? Yeah, you should ask Sam Dabi about this. Yeah, I've been to uh, several of uh, Sam Dabi's uh, plant, but my partner, we have a, a biogas plant in uh, Selama Pera. It is in the midst of, I'm not so sure whether I should call Selama Pera or Selama Kedah because it is in the border. So, uh, we planted um, oil palm. We have oil palm plantation, and what happened is that we also have oil palm mills. And uh, what we we do is that the when the uh, oil palm mills is in process, whatever waste that is generated, we converted it into uh, not only bio fertilizer but also biogas. Uh, good question being asked just now whether there is a leachate or not. It is in a very controlled environment. There are systems that we use to ensure that it does not flow to the nearby river. Yeah, And again, it's using anaerobic digestion. And um, nowadays, the organic waste that we use to ensure that it is not easily, um, uh, what we call it, uh, destroyed, we turn the uh, waste, the organic waste, for example, the empty fruit bunch, we grind it, process it, and turn it into pellet. Yeah, pellet is much more lighter, easy to store, and it is uh, slowly burned. And at the in the process of burning, it will uh, generate energy and convert it into electrical uh, energy and being used for the whole operations of the oil palm mills. So this is in Selama Kedah. So uh, I would like to draw your attention, not in Malaysia, but this is in India. I know we have participants from India. Uh, very proud to tell you, friend, that uh, I, I'm surprised, amazed to know that India has like uh, 300,000 pounds of onion uh, waste produced every day. I missed one uh, zero here. Yeah? Yeah. Sorry about that. And uh, to my surprise also that they use this waste to generate electricity, which is enough to power 460 homes. Uh, this is a very, for me, uh, not only that I am happy to know this, but I'm also uh, not only surprised, a little bit sad because, you know, India, if India can do this, why can't we? Yeah, this is talking about onion waste, just onion waste. We know that in Indian people like to... Uh, eat a lot of onion, uh, just to draw your attention here. Now we can do it. So just now I talk about the pellet. Uh, so this is the pellet that we use uh, to generate the uh, energy. And uh, these are the properties that we are looking at. At first, last, when we initially doing it in 2010, uh, we used to have uh, the empty fruit bunch uh, in a very coarse uh, sizes. But then when we further R&D on it, we thought that uh, Pellet is uh, doing a lot of uh, good job there. So this is uh, uh, another of the industry that we should uh, uh, look into. That is produ production of biofertilizer. We used to have uh, common composting. Many of the village people, the kampong people, they normally just use um, the agricultural waste as mulching, just put it on top of the bun. But uh, you can further um, access to it by having it to have a much higher in uh, nitrogen content by uh, using several types of microorganisms. Um, I have a colleague in uh, UKM, in uh, University of Bangsa and Malaysia, who focus on using chicken poo uh, and taking the bacteria from the chicken poo to do the composting onto the empty food bunch uh, fiber. Uh, so in this matter, it is called heap composting. So what they have is that they have layer of the agricultural waste. They have the uh, either the cow dung or the chicken poo, 
and then what happened is that after uh, several months about four months you can have the composting high in uh, nitrogen and uh, also high in carbon so it works well in uh, going back to the oil palm plantation yeah, you got it from the oil palm plantation, you got it back to the oil palm plantation. Uh, this is another that we have in collaboration with Agency Nuclear Malaysia, where we have uh, starch from uh, sagu tree. Uh, we use specific, uh, specific um, sagu plant. Uh, we have several species, yeah. Uh, but uh, we need to look at the sustainability by looking at the sagu plant that uh, can be harvested uh, on year on I mean uh, every day. We don't want it to be on seasonal basis. So we produce um, sachet type of film, and you can uh, see from this figure here that uh, if you use it for food, uh, edible film for food, uh, it can be a total zero waste uh, if we can have it in larger scale. Unfortunately, it is still in laboratory scale. It's not even in pilot plan yet. And um, uh, some attention to some other countries where they make use of bamboo okay, fibers. Uh, Professor Karia, we have to um, round up now because you only have one minute left. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. I will leave this uh, one. Um, yeah, scenario in Malaysia, which is still in uh, laboratory scale, uh, using it in concrete for construction. Uh, for road pavement, uh, Professor, I uh, can't remember the name, uh, Rat, uh, Ratna Sami in the UPM, University Putra, Malaysia, has successfully used oil pump front as the filler in the asphalt. And, um, well, we talked just now about LCA. And uh, why LCA is so important? is to ensure that the recycling and the disposal can be uh, managed. And uh, in terms of that, uh, yeah, as the title is, so where is the potential of 3R in managing the agricultural waste? We know that reduce, reuse, and recycling might be a failure for plastic waste without ed further educating the publics. But then for agricultural waste, reducing, reuse, and recycling play a major role. But to add to that, I believe that we need to have a redesign and a recovery. Dr. Poon has covered on this, but using a different term. But when we talk about redesigning, we are talking about redesigning the materials and also the local infrastructure. And we talk about recovery, we are talking about regenerating. And I guess we have to add another, the six R, which is responsibility and responsibility of all. So to summarize, I leave you with some questions on how does delivery system on agricultural waste being managed and how to create agricultural waste management system for all categories in Malaysia. Because we are trying to aim on zero waste to landfill by encouraging co-processing where agricultural waste is used con concurrently with the production. Thank you, Professor Amo. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, I think it looks like we have a lot of waste products to deal with and you know we need to find a lot of innovative ways to use all this waste product and I, and I and I'm thank you for sharing with us uh, how we can do this with some of the agricultural waste I mean we have about two minutes if you have any burning questions I can allow one or two questions for Professor Kyria any, any questions I mean there's a lot that she shared with us today Yeah, maybe I can Any, have one question. I mean, I mean um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Dr. Karia. A very informative uh, talk. I was uh, also thinking that uh, you actually highlighted that, um, uh, you know, where actually it should start. Is it from the industry, from the university uh, research, you know, to, to tap on this agro waste? So have you found, you know, the direction whether it should come from the industry or from the university? Um, I guess I also can play the role where uh, as panel of the ministry, uh, uh, ministry's grant, uh, we have a lot of the public uh, 
private uh, industrial grant. Uh, what when we talk about public private, it means that government itself has made the initiative, mostly through uh, YB Hairi has initiated uh, the uh, grant challenge grant. And if you can uh, see into it, it's, it's talking about hand to hand from academia researcher to industry supported by the government and public must play the role by joining hands. If we were to ask ourselves, where should it start with? We should go for technology transfer. We have a lot of innovations in the counter. We are talking about you know, university counter, but why, why can't the industry take it out? Is it because of it's not uh, fulfilling the requirements? But uh, again, uh, what I have highlighted just now, it is about the unfinished story. Many of us, the researchers, are just doing the, some parts of it, but the rest of it is left uh, undiscovered. I'm talking about the life cycle assessment. It's, it's now the focus of us. We should explore further with the help of people like Dr. Poon, like Dr. Pushpa, to see how we can ensure that the viability of the products produced from agricultural waste can uh, last long. When we say last long, still biodegradable, but it can afford to replace the whatever we have uh, as, as what we use in our daily life. I hope that's um, answering your question at the most part. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? So uh, let me thank you for your excellent presentation, Professor Kairia. Hope to see you again. Thank you. So I think we will, before the coffee break, we have got one more session before coffee break. Um, so this will be the invited speakers and speakers. So just to let you know, uh, there is about 20 minutes, uh, which we recommend five, 15 minutes presentation and five minutes for question and answer. Okay, so our next uh, speaker is, uh, is Dr. Tan Ju Xuan. Dr. Tan is a senior lecturer at the School of Industrial Technology, University Science Malaysia. He obtained his PhD in the field of bioprocessing engineering from University Putra, Malaysia. Dr. Tan is a lead consultant for several biotechnology-based companies. He's also the founder and executive director for a spin-off company, which provides technological solutions for biofermentation. He is a graduate technologist registered under the Malaysian Board of Technologists. He has published over 80 uh, journal papers indexed in Web of Science, and his current H index is 17. He serves as an active reviewer for more than 50 reputable journals, and also serves as the editorial board of several international journals. He has been involved in many projects at the International National Industry and Community Project as either project leader or co-researcher. So we would like to welcome Dr. Tan Chu Shun to give his talk on enzymatic hydrolysis and lactic acid bacteria fermentation to unlock the nutritional value from soybean residue, Okara. Dr. Tan. Okay, thank you, uh, Eric. Let me share my screen first. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, A very good morning to uh, the chairpersons and everyone. So uh, thank you for the invitations. Um, today I will talk about the enzymatic uh, hydrolysis and lactic acid bacteria fermentation to unlock the nutritional value from soybean residues. So actually um, our, our team have done on different type of agro waste um, like palm kernel cake, uh, banana waste, molasses, and but today I will focus on the okara, which is the soybean waste. So normally in our team, we will do the uh, fermentation enzymatic hydrolysis to produce some value added products to turn this waste into wealth. Yeah, so to create some zero waste in here. Yeah, some of the successful stories uh, like we already produced the bioethanol and animal feed uh, using the palm kernel cake and the functional food ingredient uh, using the okara. Yeah. 
uh, and biofertilizers uh, using the palm, palm oil waste, all these things. And we also produce the probiotics uh, using the molasses. Yeah. So uh, why I choose, but however, today I will focus on Okara because uh, this is one of the projects with the uh, industries uh, which is our best. Yeah. They are, they are food uh, processing companies and they produce um, 50 tons of okara per day. Yeah. And in, in coming this year, they will produce about 200 tons per day uh, of this okara. And they actually found, found me and to, pro, to turn all this waste into some value added products. So, soybean is a predominant ingredient in the food industry. And the waste, we call it the soybean curd residues, namely okara in Japanese, is the main surplus material of soybean product. And it is often regarded as waste. But some of the okara in Malaysia that they actually fed to the cattle. But when the waste is too uh, huge, uh, the market demand is uh, it's not sufficient to cattle all this. Therefore, uh, large quantity of okara produced per annum will lead to the environmental problems. So how are we going to turn this food waste uh, into the wealth? So we have to think about uh, the problem statement first. So okara actually, it can be used as the animal feed, but only uh, for cattle, but if you want to for use for the uh, poultry, uh, for the swan uh, industries, they have uh, it, it is low economy values because it contains uh, the anti nutritional factors uh, in the waste. And the excessive amount of okara are considered as industrial waste due to the little market value, uh, short shelf life. This is due to the high moisture content in the raw akara, which uh, will be putrefied very fast, uh, normally in one to two days, it become have a bad smell. And it, and it contains a great amount of insoluble dietary fibers and also unsavory texture in the okara. So, from this problem statement, how we, are we going to turn this waste uh, into a products, a high value products or turn into money? Yeah. So let's come to the advantages of Okara. So Okara actually uh, holds many nutrients. It has 50% uh, of carbohydrates, 20% of proteins, minerals, uh, some phytochemicals that make it suitable substrate for biotransformations. It also contains high fibers, means that it could be also used as a dietary supplement to prevent diabetes, obesity, and hyperlipidemia. <clears throat> so we have to think how we actually can turn the insoluble fiber into the soluble fiber in this case. So Okara cell wall contains polysaccharides that can be hydrolyzed into soluble sugars and used as fermentable sugar the acid material. So its proper use would lead to economic advantage and a reduction in the potential for polluting the environment. So it comes to uh, the idea by our research team, where we try to use the enzymatic treatments and lactic acid bacteria fermentation to improve its uh, nutritional quality. So in our, our objective, we try to investigate the effect of uh, enzymatic hydrolysis on the okara 
and we also to study the fermentability of the treated okara by lactobacillus acidophilus and also the nutritional values of the fermented uh, okara. The third will be to determine the metabolites of the uh, fermented okara using the GCMS. So why we use the enzyme hydrolysis? Okay. Uh, actually, we try with different uh, enzymes, and but in this uh, presentation, I will just show the viscozyme uh, enzymes. Okay. So okara cell actually has have advanced and complex structures, and viscozyme is one of the mixture of enzymes that contains uh, different uh, carbohydrates. Yeah. So this this Enzyme were this uh, integrating the okara cell wall by hydrolysis of the linkages between the structural polysaccharides, releasing the intracellular sugars and proteins. So in this uh, research, we actually use the lactobacillus species because it is normal commonly used as the starter culture, and is generally recognized as safe and is the most prominent bacteria uh, used by the food industry for fermentations. And it can actually improve the nutritional composition and reduce the anti-nutritional factors in soybeans. And <coughs> the potential used as a functional food is still limited in the research for Okara. So we uh, actually come up with some of the methods to do this. Um, so the first research methodology is the enzymatic hydrolysis using the viscodans. And then we followed by the fermentations using the lactobacillus acidophilus. Um, and lastly, we will study the metabolomics uh, of the fermented okara. So this is a general flow of our Okara biomanufacturing. Um, we start from the Okara and then we will do the solubilizations and then con followed by the enzyme, enzymatic hydrolysis and fermentations. And this Okara, okara hydrolysis, we will dry and become the food ingredients. So this is... Uh, the photo um, that we actually take during taken during our uh, experiments. So this is the raw okara when and we do the hydrolysis and fermentations. This is the fermented okara that comes. It had a very salty and sour taste. Yeah, we we actually try try this. Yeah, so. The first part will be the enzymatic hydrolysis. Yeah. After we do the hydrolysis, we actually uh, analyze the proximate compositions. So we found out that the crude protein actually uh, increase and the crude fat also increase, uh, but the carbohydrate actually decrease and the S is increased. So the it means that some of the protein uh, are actually released from the okara, yeah. and the carbohydrate actually reduce uh, could be due to the hydrolysis. Yeah. Then we actually send for HPLC analysis to uh, determine the sugars content. So <coughs> we we check on the sucrose, glucose, fructose, arabinose, raffinose, and starchose. So we can see that uh, the glucose actually increase and as well as the fructose, which are a very good source of uh, fermentable sugar for, for the lactic acid bacteria. And the raffinose and starchose are the oligosaccharides which is also have a prebiotic effect. <coughs> so in this uh, enzymatic treatment, 
uh, it actually increase the raffinous and starches. So these are uh, soybean aurigol saccharide raffinose and starches which resist uh, digestion due to the alpha galactoside in fish in their structure have prebiotic effect. And so we send for the energy uh, dispersive x-ray, the EDS analysis for the elemental determinations. Yeah, we can see the CO mass ratio is decreased because the C actually reduced the carbon. Yeah. Uh, during the hydrolysis. And we also send for the SEM uh, analysis. Yeah. We can see actually the structure of the Okara is actually uh, broken. Yeah. So it has some hole here and it releases all these sugars and proteins from the cell wall. Yeah. So after the enzymatic hydrolysis, uh, we will directly uh, put in the lactic acid bacteria, which is the lactobacillus uh, acidophilus. So <coughs> this is the growth profile of the lactobacillus acidophilus on the treated, uh, enzymatic treated okara. So it used about 16 hours to grow to the maximum, which is 16 log CFU. Uh, about 10 power of 16, yeah. So it shows that uh, this uh, Okara is very suitable for the lactobacillus to grow. And uh, as the nutrients are very fit to the lactobacillus. And we tested on the antioxidants activities of the raw okara, enzymatic treated okara, and also the fermented okara. Okay. So we can see that the from the DPPH, ABTS, and, and FRAP assays, um, the radical scavenging activities are actually increased. So from the raw okara, uh, which is about 4 to 5%, it actually increased to uh, about 40 plus percent in the uh, DPPH and ABTS. Uh, and then for FRAP, actually it increased to 60 microgram per mil. Yeah. So we can, we can know that, uh, we can see that the fermentations using the probiotics actually can increase the antioxidants level in the Okara here. So we also conducted uh, the proximate analysis. Yeah. So from here, we can see the crude protein actually increase uh, in the fermented okara, but it is not much because uh, during the fermentation, the protein actually also consumed by the lactobacillus itself as the food source yeah, or nutrients. <coughs> And the crude fat actually increased, but uh, is decreased from the enzymatic treated okara to the fermented okara. Yeah. So the ash also decreased. This could be due to the lactobacillus uh, using all these nutrients to grow. Yeah. And we can see the crude fiber actually decreased. Maybe it had turned into the soluble dietary fiber. So this one, dietary fiber, we haven't checked, determined, but we will further analyze it in futures. Yeah. So we can see that uh, in final, we have uh, actually achieved uh, better nutritional values in the fermented okara if we compare to the raw okara. Yeah. <clears throat> and then we actually conducted the metabolomic uh, studies and using the GCMS and we found that uh, these are the metabolic pathway occurring during the fermentations of Okara by lactobacillus acidophilus and the red uh, highlighted uh, phone actually is the detected metabolites that we actually uh, detected in the GCMS and 
there are some undetected metabolites like in the black color. So <coughs> there are the sugars like the glucose, uh, all these actually uh, will be categorized into here. Yeah. And we can found that uh, in the raw color, actually they don't have uh, the lactic acid, formic acid, acetic acid. Yeah. And also uh, the succinic acid. All this actually uh, is produced by the lactobacillus uh, as their byproduct when during the fermentations. Yeah. So in the metabolic uh, study, we can actually prove that they are the lactobacillus are producing this and they actually going through all this metabolic pathway. So, <clears throat> um, after all these uh, studies, then we go for the, some scaling up. We actually uh, try to hydrolyze. So we have, in, uh, have one minute left. Okay, yeah. So actually we use the two liter fermenter to uh, produce, do the enzymatic hydrolysis. And we also go through the fermentation and hydrolysis in the... 20 liters uh, fermenter. Yeah. So actually, this is how it works. Yeah. And then we go for the dowsing processing. Yeah. We dry uh, using the oven drying. We also try with the drum uh, dryer. Yeah. This is the final product that we obtain. And we actually try to formulate into some protein bar yeah in uh, as a food uh, ingredient so result of this study uh, obtained that uh, the fermented okara powder using the lactobacillus acidophilus with both uh, added nutritive value and good antioxidant activity have a potential uh, use as food ingredient and the metabolomics have successfully used in food science to evaluate the molecular fingerprints of the fermented food. And it is a promising approach to rapidly evaluate as many as possible metabolites to determine the quality, traceability, and safety of the fermented food product. So uh, in our study, we have integrated all this uh, to study the fermentation mechani mechanisms. Yeah, these are some of the reference, and these are our research team members, uh, my postgraduate students. Yeah. And thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tan. Uh, actually, we, we are run out of time, but I can still allow one question if anybody has a burning question to ask. Good morning, my name is Kumu. I'm from University of Malaya. And if you, I'd like to ask one question. Yeah, sure. All right. What is the storage life for the raw uh, okara and also the fermented okara? And uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, for the raw okara, actually, is we only can keep uh for one day if uh we put in the room temperature. So actually, we try uh to put it. Uh, in the room temperatures and the second day, the they are very bad smell come from the raw okara. In the fermented okara, we actually put for uh three to four months, but it's still uh able to uh it still can be used and there's no taste changes or contaminations happen. I see. Uh even the raw okara, even if it's oven dry, it is still the same condition. Uh, if I won't dry, then uh, it can be keep longer. Yeah. All right. Thank you, yes. Doctor. All right. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, what we can do is um, we like to thank Doctor Tan. Pardon. Any questions? No. Okay. If, if there's no questions. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Tan for his presentation. Um, what uh, This comes to the end of the morning uh, first half. So we need to take a short break.
Okay, we'll take a short 20 minutes break. Uh, can you please rejoin the Zoom at 10.55 a.m. so that we can start off at 11 o'clock sharp? Okay, thank you. It's a short break now. 11, please uh, rejoin at 10.55. Right now, what we can improve further, and then uh, I would.